Hello there, everyone. It's an absolutely gorgeous and pleasant autumn evening, and the sun is slowly setting in the west. So before the lights go out, let's get our mini service for this coming Sunday in. So what are we looking at? We're looking at lectionary number 29, proper number 24, the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, the calendar date, it will be October the 20th, 2024. Let's begin our time of worship together with this prayer. Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the peoples on earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom and make us desire always and only your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. Through his bruises we get healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all of our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him. On him. He was beaten, he was tortured, but he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to be slaughtered, and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried, and he was let off. And did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare. Beaten bloody for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with a rich man, even though he'd never hurt a soul or said one word that wasn't true. Still, it's what God had in mind all along, to crush him with pain. The plan was that he give himself as an offering for sin so that he'd see life come from it. Life, life, and more life. And God's plan will deeply prosper through him. Out of that terrible travail of soul, he'll see that it's worth it and be glad he did it. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous ones as he himself carries the burden of their sins. Therefore, I'll reward him extravagantly, the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death in the face and didn't flinch, because he embraced the company of the lowest. He took on his own shoulders the sin of many, and he took up the cause of all the black sheep. Our psalm for this week is from Psalm 91, uh, beginning with verse 9. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your habitation, no evil will befall you, nor shall aff affliction come near your dwelling. For God will give the angels charge over you to guard you in all their ways. <clears throat> Excuse me. Upon their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion cub and viper. You will trample down the lion and the serpent. I will deliver those who cling to me. I will uphold them because they know my name. They will call me and I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. With long life will I satisfy them and show them my salvation. Our second reading is from the fifth chapter of Hebrews. Every high priest selected to represent men and women before God and offer sacrifices for their sins should be able to deal gently with their failings, since he knows what it's like from his own experience. But that also means that he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as the people's. No one elects himself to this honored position. He's called to it by God, as Aaron was. Neither did Christ presume to set himself up as high priest, but was set apart by the one who said to him, You're my son. Today I celebrate you. 
In another place, God declares, You are priest forever in the royal order of Melchizedek. While he lived on earth, anticipating death, Jesus cried out in pain and wept in sorrow as he offered up priestly prayers to God. Because he honored God, God answered him. Though he was God's son, he learned trust obedience by what he suffered, just as we do. Then, having arrived at the full stature of his maturity and having been announced by God as high priest in the order of Melchizedek, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who believingly obey him. And we have our gospel reading from the 10th chapter of Mark. James and John, Zebedee's sons, came up to him. Teacher, we have something we want you to do for us. What is it? I'll see what I can do. Arrange it, they said, so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your glory. One of us at your right, the other at your left. Jesus said, you have no idea what you're asking. Are you capable of drinking the cup I drink, of being baptized in the baptism I'm about to be plunged into? Sure, they said, why not? Jesus said, come to think of it, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized in my baptism. But as to awarding the places of honor, that's not my business. There are other arrangements for that. When the other ten heard of this conversation, they lost their tempers with James and John. Jesus got them together to settle things down. You've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, he said, and when people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. The Gospel of our Lord. All right. As always, (laughs) I know I say it every Sunday, There's a lot going on in these passages. Uh, We start out with that passage from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. This is the fourth of what are known as the suffering servant songs. And if you may recall, we've talked about this where, who is this suffering servant? Is it the actual prophet Isaiah? Is it the people of Israel who are, you know, in captivity in Babylon and are suffering because of it? Or is it some future leader who takes upon him a lot of bad stuff in order that the people might be redeemed hmm yeah problematic isn't it well maybe it's all three maybe it's all three maybe it is that servant who took on the role of prophet and as a prophet was talking to the people. The people didn't want anything to do with him. Ignored him. Beat him up. Killed him. Yeah. They just, they said, just no way this is happening to us. And although it could have been the people of Israel themselves as a whole. Yeah. uh, The people who were called to be a light to the Gentiles. Now they're in captivity. There's no way they can be a light to the Gentiles, a light to the world if they're in captivity. The whole thing is just going down the tubes. Or is it a coming prophet, a coming individual who is going to set things right again between the people and God? And who is that coming person who takes on the burden of our wickedness, the burden of our failures? Uh, See, we have all that going on in this passage from Isaiah. This same passage we read on Good Friday because as Christians, as we look at it, we say, hey, we know who that is. We know who's done those things for us. It's Jesus. He has done it for us. He has given us that that new way to live. He has taken upon us our sin and he's taken up the cause of all of us black sheep as we just read now <clears throat> we have another thing to look at when we look at Psalm 91 and here it talks about and this is very important making God Yahweh the Lord our refuge 
and God, the Most High, Adonai, our habitation. Yeah, that's very, very important to keep that in mind because what we have coming here is can easily be misinterpreted as, okay, if I name God as my God, my God, if I name Yahweh as my God, you know, nothing bad will ever happen to me. I, I just know it. It just won't. It can't because, hey, that's the deal God gives to us, right? It says it right there. Well, you know what? Read this a little more carefully. Read this psalm a little bit closer and you find out that bad stuff happens even to good people. And what it's telling us is in the midst of those bad times, God will answer our call. They will call me and I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. This is Psalm 91. Go back to Psalm 23. What does it say? The Lord is my shepherd, right? Though I walk through that valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear anything because God, you are with me. You are with me. So keep all that in mind. It's a powerful, powerful image. And think about what we just read in the Isaiah text, too. How this suffering servant suffers on our behalf. He's right there in the midst of our suffering, taking it upon himself as well. We get to Hebrews, the fifth chapter. And as I've said week after week, the second reading doesn't always fit in. But this fits in kind of nicely because it's talking about who Jesus is as our great high priest what jesus isn't our great high priest well the writer of hebrews says he is and he, he's using that imagery that the people would be familiar with to show exactly how god is working and operating in the world in his time jesus has come and it, well let's look at it this way he's the ultimate high priest um, in fact, he's so ultimate, which means last, which means we don't need any more high priests. He's it. He's it. We don't need any more sacrifices in the temple, which is a, whew, oh, it's a good thing you said that, God, because at this point in time, when Hebrews is being written to the people, there's no more temple. It's been destroyed by the Romans. They cannot offer sacrifices there. It's been it's over and done with but then again look at what Jesus has done he's offered himself as the great high priest he, he's offered himself also as the ultimate sacrifice on that cross for you and for me Wow there's a lot of stuff going on in that those few short verses you got to keep that in mind right now let's get to our gospel reading from from Mark Boy, I got all kind of bugs flying around me today so you see me swatting them away it's getting a little buggy out here right now but in our reading from mark this is the third time now that jesus has told his disciples he has to go to jerusalem and die and i say it's the third time we didn't read that but it happens just before this reading and it's not part of our uh gospel uh, reading for this sunday but it's there and what's important to keep you have to keep that in mind because three times jesus tells them he's going to die and three times somebody puts their foot in their mouth first time it's peter who's uh says oh jesus you're the, you're the messiah and and you're the christ and jesus says yeah and and i have to die and peter says no you're not gonna die and jesus says just get behind me satan you know he, 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 so it, it's there it's there the second time which is what we had uh, last week, the disciples, Jesus has said he had to go to Jerusalem to die. And what do they do? They get into an argument amongst themselves as, who's the greatest? And um, come on, you guys, are you're not getting, you're not getting the point. If you want to be great, you must be the servant of all. And so what do you have here today? You have Jesus announced once again that he has to go to Jerusalem to die. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come up to him and say, Hey, Jesus, hey, can you do something for us? Jesus says, Well, let's, let's hear it. I'll see what I can do for you. Um, 
Give us the highest places of honor when you come in your glory. You know, one on your right, one on your left, which is, you know, typical of what would happen in that day. And Jesus said, um, you haven't been paying much attention to what I've been talking about with all this thing, talk on discipleship and what it means to follow me. Have you guys? Because don't you realize, you know what? You, you, you're incapable of doing that. Uh, can you really drink the cup I'm about to drink? Are you? Can you go through the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? Now, those two disciples kind of look at each other and go, well, um, they had no idea what Jesus was talking about. They didn't understand about death and dying for the sake of the kingdom. Sure, they said, why not? You know what Jesus says? You know what? You will. You will drink of that cup. And that cup is referenced, referenced time and time again in the Old Testament as a cup of suffering. You will drink that cup. You will be baptized in, in the same baptism that I am. Again, time and time again, images of water, being plunged into water, being immersed in water, baptism, not a good thing in the Old Testament. Um, so, you know what? It's going to happen to you. Now, as far as being number one and number two in my kingdom, that's not up to me. Now, now the other ten disciples that said heard this and they got all just really put out with James and John and just said, hey, how, how in the world can you do stuff like that? And Jesus said, yeah, hold the phone. Hold the phone here. Let's just let's talk about this. You, you see how people struggle with this whole idea of, being in power well you know they want to be in power they want to rule over other people but i'm telling you this being number one and number two means being the servants of all you know it's to be the greatest you must become a servant you must become a slave to everyone else it doesn't mean you lord over them no it means you are here to serve them. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to live in God's kingdom. Now, we've had three times Jesus saying to the disciples, this is what it means to live as part of the kingdom. And three times, one or more of them put their foot in their mouths and really showed that Jesus that they didn't understand and Jesus is not going to back down. He's time and time again, it says, it's all about living for others, not being number one, not lording over them, but instead serving them, serving them in, in wholeness and, and being there for them and lifting them back out, out of their difficult moments. That's what it means to be a part of God's kingdom. Okay, well, I think it's time now to move into a time of prayer. And as we do that, think about these different ways that God has reached out to us to tell us what it means to be one of his followers. Challenged by God's word in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and the whole creation. Holy One, we give thanks for all servant leaders of the church, bless bishops, pastors, and deacons with humble wisdom and ground them in your love. God of grace, hear our prayer. Creative One, we give thanks for the delicate balance of the natural world. Kindle in us a spirit of caring strength in the preservation of habitats, food availability, and centers of refuge that all wildlife may thrive. God of grace, hear our prayer. Empowering one, fill the leaders of governments with a spirit of service that prioritizes those on the margins due to job loss, underemployment, unsafe working conditions, and immigration status. May economic equity be achieved for all people. God of grace, hear our prayer. Abiding one, you call pastors to shepherd the congregation toward faithful living as servants and followers of Jesus. Inspire all ordained ministers and seminarians to ministry that challenges 
engages, and comforts those in their care. God of grace, hear our prayer. Saving one, we give thanks for the disciples, James and John, and all saints who have faithfully served you. We rejoice in a promised place at the feast of victory that we receive by your grace alone. God of grace, hear our prayer. In your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the saving grace you freely give, both now and forever. Amen. And now we join and pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. God's blessings be with you on this glorious time of autumn as we just look in and just just are bathed in his beautiful sunshine and the, the beautiful autumn leaves. Oh, what better way to celebrate than taking a nice brisk walk this afternoon. God's blessings be with you. <music>